Okay, so welcome to the second series, uh, second of our series of three seminars uh, where we're looking at the synergies that can be achieved when uh, you look at this and Local Law 97 collaboratively. Uh, my name is Stephen Lyde, I'm CEO of Canny, and uh, again I'll be hosting uh, the session today. Uh, as a recap of last week, uh, let me uh, just uh, click the slide on so you can see that. Um, we uh, essentially we looked at the timelines for Local Law 97 and FISP and we started to dig into why we believe there are both strategic and financial benefits in assessing and developing a plan across both. In addition, we took you through the steps for an investigation across both culminating in case studies and the impact that, that both pieces of legislation present to ownership. If you are unable to attend the first seminar, we are able to give you access to the full recording. So uh, developing such a strategy requires a multidiscipline approach. Uh, you need experts from the respective fields contributing collaboratively to build up a total picture. And this is the way that Canny has approached this, uh, drawing from both its own team of architects, structural engineers, experts in FISP, coupled with key partnerships uh, with uh, companies such as MG Engineering, who are speaking today, and other testing agencies. As a result, we offer an end-to-end -end services from investigation through development and construction in order to allow you to achieve full compliance. As we progress through this webinar, webinar today, we want to foster conversation rather than it being a lecture. So please use the Q&A component of Zoom uh, to ask a question, and I will ensure that I uh, interject in the dialogue uh, as soon as I can. We're going to continue where we left off from last week, and so I'm happy to introduce John Rudisill and Thomas Seminara from Canny and Adam Faber from MG Engineering. Uh, gentlemen, perhaps you could just provide a word of introduction to yourselves. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Rudisill, and I'm a vice president at Canny. Uh, I've been with uh, Canny now for a little over 21 years. Uh, my focus uh, uh, recently has been in ground up, primarily in ground up new construction, as well as uh, redevelopment of existing properties, uh, including facade replacement, cladding, and uh, window replacement. Uh, I'm also joined with uh, Thomas Simonera from the existing buildings and uh, restoration side of the aisle. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to part two of our uh, webinar. And we're here today with Adam. Hey all, my name is Adam Farber. I run the uh, Sustainability and Commissioning Group at MG Engineering. Um, we are a uh, multi multidisciplinary MEP engineering firm based in the city, um, focusing on uh, ground up residential, retail, office spaces, uh, hotels, as well as commercial fit outs um, and building repositioning projects. Um, I, we spoke last week a good deal about a Local Law 97, a combined Local Law 97 and FISP approach um, which is what we're going to focus on today in detail. But um, very briefly, my company has been involved along with Caddy um, for a few months now in looking at the Local Law 97 impacts of existing systems, whether it's mechanical systems, lighting, hot water, or envelope systems on the energy use of a building. And we'll get into that more in detail today. Great. So let's talk about what is. Um you know, what's involved in this uh, Local Law 97 um, FISP readiness analysis and report. Um, you know, we want to tackle, like Adam just said, you know, we're looking to look at buildings holistically, uh, not just the building envelopes, but the mechanical systems and their operations. So the first part of that um, is, uh, Adam, uh, you, you can talk about what, what is actually involved in that Local Law 97, and in particular, the, the enhanced uh, Level 1 ASH rate analysis. So there are really two parts to the analysis. We went over this somewhat last week, so I'll, I'll go review very quickly, and then we'll go in detail um, into the parts we didn't discuss. Um, we looked at the financial analysis last week. We looked at that in some detail regarding the uh, energy usage in a building and how it impacts in terms of your greenhouse gas emissions and what your local law 97 fine and penalty might be. Um, we looked at how to make that uh, how to create the calculation. Um, I just want to repeat very quickly a couple of different points because they're points that we've gotten questions on and they're really important and worth mentioning. Um, two specific points. One of them is you have to look at all different fuel types in the building. That's something I'll mention in a few moments, but if your building runs on, obviously all buildings run on Con Ed electricity, 
at least in the city, um, some buildings run on Conned steam, some buildings run on natural gas, some buildings are still oil powered. These are things that you really need to look at in depth are the different fuel types um, uh, that are all available in your building. Many buildings will have all or some of those fuel types and you have to look at them in depth. The other thing that's very important to remember is that you have to look at all energy use within the walls of your building. And that includes separately metered and sub-metered spaces. So if you've got a ground floor retail space that's on a separate utility meter, it has to be included in this analysis, which means that you're gonna need access to the billing and the energy usage. Um, if you have a, 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 excuse me, a residential condo and all of the residences are separately metered, that is very complicated at times to get, gain access to the billing, but it does have to be done. Um, and the city gave us, we discussed last week, the timeline for Local Law 97. You have a few years to do it, um, but it is something that you have to get a jump on and, uh, and get into. So that covers the financial analysis. Um, I, I do want to go into a little more detail about a, um, the second bullet, which is the review of existing HVAC equipment and building operations. Um, because it's not just as simple as uh, taking a look at the, your Energy Star benchmark data and we really need to gain it better. So let's, let's move on into and, and, and get into some of this. Uh, some right. of so, so I want to give on the, uh, if we go to the next slide, um, I, I just want to give a, uh, um, a kind of a quick overview of the type of thing that we might look at in your building. Um, right now, we're just focusing on kind of the investigation. I'll get into some solutions later on, um, but the, the first step really is just to know what you have and what your systems are in the building. We're gonna look at, um, these are just three types of equipment. Um, we're gonna look at, as I mentioned before, for the financial analysis, you need to make sure you cover all of your different energy fuel types in the building, whether it's electricity, steam, natural gas, et cetera. Um, in this photo, the photo on the left of the hot water heaters, you'll see steam powered hot water heaters. Um, so it's just, you know, these are just kind of examples of the types of things we look at. We will look at, make sure we look at something of, of all energy usage types. We're going to look at large building wide equipment, such as cooling towers, which you'll see in the middle photo. Um, and we're going to look at uh, smaller equipment. Um, this happens, these, these photos are taken from a typical Upper East Side residential tower. It's actually a luxury condo on the Upper East Side. Um, but you can see we're going into the residences. This was a vacant apartment and we're looking at the typical residential air conditioning units um, because there's no way to address this system. There's no way to address Local Law 97 only looking at house equipment. If you're only looking at large equipment, chillers and water heaters and cooling towers, um, you're skipping a huge amount of the energy usage and that's what's going on inside the units, whether it's a residential tower or a commercial or a retail structure. Um, you will have to look at that. We're going to look at the lighting systems and the lighting controls. Um, those are they're frequently areas of potential energy um, spill and energy savings. Um, but the larger point is that and, and the reason that we're really looking at an integrated approach to Local Law 97 and FISP um, is something that John and Tom will get into in detail. You can't get here, you can't get to Local Law 97 compliance often just looking at the HVAC equipment. Right. You're going to have to look at the building envelope as well. Um, and that's why this combined approach towards the building and towards these two local laws makes a ton of sense. Right, have, right. Have just a, a quick question. Somebody was just asking, this includes supplemental units as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, that's, a, that's actually a great question, um, David Daido. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, but that's a great question because it's something that you often don't have a full handle on in your building. Um, and you really may have to do a survey and gain access to all of those units and make sure that you have the full energy usage of those units as well as the existing, yeah. So I, I, that's a good point to, to note because it reinforces the fact that this is something that we need to get ahead of because just gaining access to all the individual apartments, obtaining the individual uh, electric bills for all these um, you know, hundreds of uh, apartments in a building can take some time. Absolutely. It, it, it can take, it take months and months to, to actually get everybody to comply. Right. So uh, reinforcing the fact that we have to get ahead of this, we need to plan and we need to be prepared to be able to execute right. for 2024. 
So while you're investigating the, the operations and the equipment of a building on a parallel path, we can move on to the next slide. We're gonna be, um, you know, Candy would be looking at the building envelope and, and what that envelope impact is, step one, on, on energy use. So we'll perform a visual survey of the building and ascertain the, the conditions of the exterior walls, the roofs, we're looking at sealant joints, we're looking windows. at the uh, windows are gonna be huge. Um, and then we'll also perform We'll engage uh, some, uh, we're, we're working with a company called Building Envelope Testing LLC uh, that does a wonderful job of uh, some of this uh, forensic investigation in terms of on-site air and water, fill, water infiltration. Um, you know, we're leaking buildings, that's a uh, consideration for sure, but we need to measure. You know, once you understand how much energy the building is using and how much carbon emissions there is, you need to understand why. You know, where's the energy being used? Um, and, and, and what's driving that, right? And so the, the performance of the building envelope in terms of just air infiltration, how many exchanges of air uh, in, in each floor per hour, uh, it's gonna drive the, uh, drive the uh, performance of the mechanical systems. Um, we're gonna look at probes as well. We understand um, how these, you know, the composition of the, of the exterior walls and the roof, really gauge how much insulation there is. That's another uh, point where the FISP and Volcal 97 converge because depending on the type of building, probes may be required right. as part of the FISP survey and reportage. Right. So in conjunction with understanding the condition of the wall, the components and how they perform, we also have to verify the safety of the wall as it relates well, to the wall ties. And the new FISP requirements mandate the uh, probes for cavity walls, and we'll talk about that yep. too. And then another part of the investigation that we do is, is actually some real thermal modeling. You know, we're gonna understand how these, these walls perform. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, this will just provide owners and, and building managers with a real comprehensive, holistic view of their building. How much energy are we using? Where's it going? And how's my envelope contributing to that? But then we're gonna go a little bit further here into to some FISC considerations. Um, because FISC will certainly uh, most certainly impacts you know, your strategy in terms of long-term compliance with uh, Local 097 and FISP Cycle 9 and Cycle 10. Um, you know, we need to understand, number one, from a FISP point of view, that the buildings must be safe, right? I mean, so, I mean, it doesn't mean that you can, you can have a filing, uh, ideally a filing of safe. You can also have a filing of, if there are some minor repairs, I suppose, right? Uh, that's where the swarm comes right. in. Safe. The safety repair and maintenance program filing That'll give you a little bit more time to deal with some of these, these repairs in order to get to a completely safe filing. Uh, but but right. having a safe filing doesn't mean that you have a wall that does not really get air anymore. Right, right. And you can have, you can, you can have a safe FISP filing, but, but the building does not perform at all uh, in terms of uh, thermal performance and energy, and, and it could still be in a, in a very bad position for compliance with uh, Local Law 97, 20, 24 especially in 2030. So, so there's some special considerations here. This is where FISP and uh, Local 97 really uh, converge, and it makes sense to have this holistic approach because there's two types of walls in particular that, that are heavily impacted by this, and that's masonry cavity wall construction um, as well as uh, curtain wall, early generation curtain walls. And so if we want to talk about, uh, Thomas, you can talk about the typical cavity walls. Um, this is a big deal, uh, right? Because yes. en energy and FISP. Um, so here you're looking at two samples of cavity wall construction. Uh, the picture on the left, building was built in early 1950s. Picture on the right, building was built in the mid 1990s. Totally different appearance. The building on the right sure looks a lot nicer, um, but they both perform really poorly. Right. Um, they, there's no air and moisture barrier. There's no insulation in the cavities. Um, the, Building on the left has certainly has uh, more problems with inadequacy, inadequacy of wall ties than the one on the on the right. But nonetheless, the, the problems that are uh, common in each of these buildings, this is a widespread right. problem. You know, the, 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 the early cavity walls like that, that one on the left, that 1950s and then even the 60s and the 70s, I mean, these walls um, have... Uh, you, corroded or deteriorated wall ties. You know, yep. Structural supports are often aging and deteriorated. Shelf yeah, shelf hangs are in poor condition. Uh, and you can see, in, in, even in that photograph, the mismatched brick on, on that elevation 
it just uh, reinforces the fact that over the years, this building is- They require regular, regular maintenance. Regular maintenance Never. that does not improve anything except for keeping the public safe. Exactly. Uh, you know, and compounded by that building has to be a glazed brick building, which is even a worse performing um, substrate that requires constant maintenance. And the reason we're calling, you're really focusing on the 1950s to the, even the late 1990s, early 2000 masonry cavity walls is because they didn't have, uh, the, there was no mandate for continuous air moisture barriers and insulation. Looks like we're back everybody. Apologize for this. We had a, a, a glitch here, obviously. So we left off here. We're gonna move on to the next slide, Stephen. We wanna talk about real quick here, we'll show you some pictures of the uh, cavity wall conditions. All right, here we go. So uh, you know, really quickly, these are typical conditions that we've, we've come across over the years. And you know, in the photo, number one there is really, really a unbelievably poorly constructed backup wall. Not really typical, but we've seen it, it, it exists. Uh, impossible to to um, yeah that's a that's a pretty pretty extreme condition here but then that's and then it gets a little bit back 1950s right? and then the one on the right is a, uh, is a that was actually a 19 early 1990s uh, masonry cavity wall and so in in that picture you can see he's taken at the jam of a window and what you're looking at is the wood blocking that the window was attached to you see the CMU and and the reinforced concrete structure. But it's, it's obvious there are voids in between the block and, and the wall, the block and, and the concrete frame. These are all passageways for air, moisture, and without rectifying those, right. closing them up and doing a continuous air barrier system, you're not going to stop the air infiltration. And, uh, and, and part of this, again, is the thermal model you know, for, um, you know, for these kinds of cavity walls. This is just an example of... You know, we're looking at the image on the left is, is uh, an existing conditions, cavity wall building, no air moisture barrier, no insulation, like Thomas said. In conjunction with this analysis, we'll be working with, uh, you know, MG engineering and, and modeling certain approaches, what we can do to improve the performance of the, of the cavity wall in accordance with the actual building's needs. Now, we also do this with, uh, with curtain wall as well. Uh, and this is another type of building envelope system that is, is heavily impacted by. Once again, folks, I apologize. We seem to have some serious uh, internet service provider issues today. But anyway, let's move on here. We talked about some of the early uh, day curtain walls, and we have a couple photographs here of what some of these uh, conditions look like. So as you can see, you know, these, these older generation curtain walls, the ceilings are all deteriorated at this point in time. You've got uh, monolithic glass in your windows. Uh, nothing is thermally broken uh, at this stage in the game. No insulation at the spandrel panels. Right, right. And then the anchorage, you know, because these curtain walls have been leaking for 30 years, uh, the actual structural supports of the, of the mullion framings. Uh, Often corroded. Right, right. Yeah. right. So, you know, one option briefly, let's say with these types of curtain walls, if you move on to the next, is uh, this is where window replacement and, and like facade recladding become real considerations um, for, these, for these types of buildings. You got to get insulated glass. You have to somehow retrofit. There are some relatively affordable options that you can do retrofit to these types of walls rather than do a full, full facade rip and replacement. And, and, and the great benefit of that is increasing. Not only do you mitigate the local 097 and the FISP issues, you provide a, a class A appearance right. to the building. You, you know, you upgrade the marketability. The, you know, so we're, we're looking at all these options here. And, um, and, then, and then on a parallel path here, once we identify some options for the building envelope, let's talk about some mechanical options. You know, you wanna, you wanna start some phased approaches, maybe deal with some of the more affordable things for the first deadline. Yeah, so, so I'll talk about that. If you, uh, if you wanna flip forward, actually, we can, we can move on to the next slide even, because I'll, yeah. I'll go through these very quickly, but we're going to look at, um, uh, we're going to look at, obviously you want to look at the, the low hanging fruit first. That's a term, you know, that gets thrown around a lot, but it's, I mean, there's, there's a reason. Um, and so we're going to look at things like just controls. If you look at, this is the residential AC unit that I showed you before. And if you look at that close up on the right, it's just the control panel for this AC unit is just on, basically on off cold or hotter. You know, there's no way to, for a resident to say, well, you know, I'm gonna be out of the house all day. I don't need the unit to be on, but I'd like it to turn on maybe a half hour or an hour before I get back home. 
Um, and so you've got these units that kind of inherently, the way they're designed, give a huge energy waste to a building. And, uh, and we'll look at those, and these are some of the lower costs, um, potentially and easier fixes, even though they may be, um, may be looking at stuff that's in unit, may be repeated um, for you know, potentially hundreds of residential units. So like automated, automated climate controls, Absolutely. automated lighting, Absolutely. that has dramatic impacts on energy use right off the bat. Absolutely. And then uh -huh. things like, for example, you know, if we have to you know, reseal a caulk a building temporarily just to cut the air infiltration, that helps. Um, Absolutely, and they play have to, to each other. Yeah, um, yeah. You, you're not, as, as, as we said, um, you're not gonna cut the energy usage by just looking at the mechanical or just looking at the envelope. You wanna look at both. Um, and uh, and that's, the, that's the benefit of combining your approach here. Um, if we move on to the next slide, we're also gonna look at potentially, um, for some buildings, we'll look at um, higher and more substantial upgrades if the building warrants that if the situation we might look at a chiller replacement as you can see um, we might look at converting from the fuel type uh, steam is a pretty expensive fuel to use and a lot of buildings are looking to move off of it if possible um, so we'll look at we'll look at kind of the low hanging fruit as i said we'll also look at more substantial upgrades if applicable if necessary um, and uh, you know one way or another we'll combine with the envelope we'll come to um, the ideal solution to your building. So this is where, you know, we really, the, the case for this, this, the synergy, you know, really reinforcing the synergy between Local 097 and FISP. As we said, the timelines are basically intertwined. The deadlines converge at the same time. Um, and, and mitigating the problem is not going to be accomplished by one facet or the other. So, so what we want to do is be able to give building owners and, uh, and managers you know, some options here because uh, some buildings have some serious, are facing some, some pretty substantial fines in 2024 or actually 2025 is when you file. I think we want to be clear about that. With Local 97, really, you've got to have your, the building is going to be measured in the, in the year 2024. Yes. And, and it's, yeah. Right. So the law takes effect in, um, it's actually May 1st of 2025, at which point you are expected to report your 2024 energy usage data. Right. Um, we went through this in detail last time, so I don't want to spend too much time on this now, um, but you, your 2024 energy usage, which is really only a couple of years from now, has to be under the limit for your building, um, and which is why you want to look at it now, because if you look at it right now, if you look at your energy usage now, let's say you look at your 2019 data, which is the last full year on record, and you find that you're considerably over the limit, well, now you have, let's say, two to three years to get yourself under the limit so that your 24 data will be compliant. And when you report it in 25, you won't face a fine. Mm -hmm. um, those limits for your building, I mentioned the energy limit, that those drop every five years. So limits are in 2024, 29, 34, 39, and all the way through 2050. Um, and the limits are pretty aggressive. Um, I have not looked at a building yet that will be compliant all the way through uh, through 2050, even though the city hasn't fully published all of the limits at this point. Right. And so if you have a building that is facing, for example, we have a couple of, of, of properties that are facing unsafe FISP conditions. You know, there's, they have to do repairs on the building uh, envelope. Those are almost always uh, uh, cavity wall buildings. And, and then they also are facing you know, fines in 2024. Um, so, and then, and then, of course, then it would go out through 2030. But if you have to do a, a, a you know, million dollar, a multi-million dollar facade repair, um, we want to be able to look at options here where maybe you need to start integrating and phasing in some substantial upgrades or replacements. Um, rather than rip and tear off, for example, a masonry cavity wall, we can stabilize it structurally and then clad it, something that's affordable. Yeah, there are, so, there are so, many options to, to deal with that, yep. depending and, on your budget and you know what your end right. goal is. Um, from like like you said, from a simple stabilization and and uh, re reclad into a major removal and um, re basically redevelopment mm -hmm. of of the uh, of the property to increase its marketability, to increase the property value, to make it function, and to be a, a leader in the industry as opposed to a you know. Um, well, constantly chasing down the compliance goals, right? So, I mean, I think that, 
you know, it's important to take a look at this where, you know, we're looking at it for 20, 30, a 10 year, 15 year, 20 year approach here. Uh, and in some cases, you end up at the end of the day completely repositioning a property. Uh, but the goal here is to give um, owners a, a an outline, you know, a prioritized phased approach to deal with both the building operating systems as well as the envelope. Um, and um, yeah, basically achieve compliance all the way through to, uh, to 2050. And don't forget all these, this information needs to be posted, right? Starting uh, next year or so, we need to post a letter grade for your FISP, your, uh, right. your benchmark status for local 97. Um, it's, it's exactly. And, and when do you get started? I've had uh, clients asking like, well, how much, I mean, how much time do I have? Right. Well, well, as, as Adam just said, we start measuring energy. You know, we're, we're going to be re reporting the 2024 energy use. And, uh, and that's right when the first, uh, the, the cycle nine fist pens as well, about 2024, 2025, you want to, you want to get, you want to do the investigation and understand where your position is now. Uh, if you wait to, obviously this is the case with all kinds of, uh, construction. If you wait to the last minute when the demand is, is very, very high, you're going to have trouble, uh, you know, manufacturers and fabricators are going to, there's going to be longer lead times. Uh, contractor availability. Yeah, and it's also the fact that understanding that these things aren't cheap and you need to budget as a building for this expenditure. So doing it ahead of doing it now gives you a few years to prepare, save, get financing. All right. And, th and that leads us into a good intro to um, moving to, to the next part of this webinar series, which is the next slide. Right, um, part three, like how do I pay for it, right? So the, that's, that's the big right. question here. If I'm faced with, you know, 10 million, $15 million worth of, you know, building envelope for renovations as well as mechanical upgrades, how do I pay for this? Particularly now more than ever, uh, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the current state that we're in, this has become an incredible challenge. It was already challenging before, but now it's even more. Um, and that's where we're gonna talk about the, uh, the PACE financing, which is the property assessed uh, clean energy. Which I believe, if we get that, let's ask, ask one of the questions. Um, they would, it was a question about. Uh, let's there's a question uh, we've got about uh, whether there's a need to document all the lighting for the building, Adam. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, document all the lighting for the building. Yeah, so lighting is uh, obviously a huge energy user. Um, it's a huge energy suck in a building. Um, lighting and lighting controls. Um, I'll, I would say that most of the lighting throughout the city, this is a, an enormous generalization, but I'm gonna stick with it anyway. Most of the lighting throughout the city has been upgraded. So it's uncommon to go into a building and still see incandescence everywhere. Um, it, we, it happens and we see it. Um, and that is certainly a, a relatively easy and quick way to gain some energy savings, um, but it's not super common anymore. Lighting controls is a much bigger issue. Um, there are a ton of buildings I've been into where the building installed a time clock or occupancy sensors, let's say, for the seller level. Um, but the, the, the building maintenance guys are uncomfortable because it gets dark down there and they're scared, so they just leave the lights on 24-7. And so the building was designed efficiently um, and given these efficient controls, but they're not in use. And that, that stuff happens all the time. So absolutely, we will look at lighting. Um, we will look at lighting controls, and, and potentially those could be easy and quick areas for energy savings. Another question was, do, do we partner with the contractors to, um, to, to fine tune our pricing? And, and yeah, most well, absolutely. I mean, we, 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 you know, contractors, general contractors, I mean, we have a building where they're looking at, again, substantial, I mean, substantial mechanical equipments, uh, uh, retrofits that they have to do, uh, as well as it, it, in the most uh, <laughs> dire case, I should say, there's an envelope that needs to be replaced. It'll never be able to be uh, uh, repaired or restored enough. Um, so so we, we do work with uh, general contractors and to come up with budgets. You know, the part of the report is we're going to give you cost estimates, and, but those are cost estimates that are based upon, you know, real uh, uh, scope of conversations with uh, contractors. With vendors, with manufacturers. Of course. To make sure that, you know, we're, we're as accurate as possible. Um, we have certainly, you know, a lot of experience in, between the, the companies that we partner with in 
dealing with these things, but there's nothing uh, like getting a you know contract oh, yeah. to, to understand uh, logistics, which o often are. Uh, well, you got to get all of your hard costs and your soft costs. You got to understand what what it's going to take to to mobilize, what it's going to take to uh, you know. In the, in the case of a building envelope, how are you, if you're going to replace the facade, you do it with swing stage scaffolding, mass climbers, pipe stage. Every building is a little bit different. Yeah. All the challenges of mobilizing the site and accessing all elevations yeah. are very different. And I'm sure we have very, very similar conditions and, and considerations with, uh, with the mechanical side of things. Of course, you know, every, every building's got its own system and every building, um, you know, especially we've been talking a lot about 1950s, 60s, 70s buildings, you know, these systems have been tinkered with for years. So um, the, the potential upgrades and the potential um, uh, the potential fixes and energy efficiency measures that we could install might be a little different for each building. We will certainly interface with um, with uh, uh, contractors as needed to get get better pricing idea and to firm up the um, our, any any estimates that we give you. Um, and we could recommend contractors as needed. You know, there's also another integration between the mechanical, electrical, and the facades where you have these through wall air conditioning sleeves in many buildings which are basically holes in the wall that are poorly insulated, poorly, poorly not insulated at all, yeah. stuck with newspaper and foam often, and, and uh, you know, just bleed, bleed air through. Um, so again, a very common, uh, very common occurrence in, in buildings of, of that vintage and something that really needs to uh, be looked at specifically and have the right, you know, approach to, to be able to mitigate the issues. Right. And then, and then, like we said here, the next, the final part of this is we're going to be um, bringing in a, the law firm of uh, Duval Stackenfeld. Uh, these guys are um, experts at this pace financing, which was it was actually part of the local loan ninety seven. Um, you know, we got to give uh, building owners uh, and managers you know options in, in, of affordable financing to achieve these goals because it's an incredible burden uh, on everybody, and we, we recognize that, and that's why we want it to be. A, strategically about our recommendations in terms of providing a prioritized phased approach, and then B, you know, working with uh, some, some some companies that come up with some long-term uh, financing financing right. options. To right. Make. Yeah. The, you know, the goal for, for the report is to give you the tools that you need for every aspect of, of this uh, comprehensive and complicated um, local law ninety-seven and FISP program that. Uh, you all need to uh, comply with. So we have the experts for each facet assembled um, with the end goal to provide you with a roadmap to mitigate your expenditure, to keep your building safe, to keep the uh, air and water out of the building. And minimize your energy use. I actually did have a, a, a there was a, a client that asked us, uh, how does COVID affect all of this? And, um, you know, it's, it's you know, about right now, buildings are empty, right? They're, they're mostly empty and they're, they're operation. Obviously, they, their energy usage right now is, is, is basically low. So we would have to look at, in order to get started, it's, yeah, it's you'd very, have to look at historical data at, it's, right now. It's, it's, so COVID has, has really obviously thrown the entire universe for a loop. Um, in terms of energy usage, I am very reluctant, as John just intimated, I'm very reluctant to use 2020 data as a historical indicator because buildings aren't occupied. Um, on the flip side, residential buildings are way more occupied yeah. than they ever were. Right. People who normally are out all day aren't. That's great. And so... Yeah. And so energy usage is very wonky over the last few months. And so it's really, it's a good idea to look at 2019 and even potentially 2018. Um, you're, you're starting to get into territory where occupancies may have been different. Um, upgrades on a building may have already happened. And so you really have to take a, 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 an educated and intelligent look at your energy usage. Um, but, uh, but definitely um, 2020 is an odd year, as everyone knows. The flip side is that right now, as John said, buildings are, are largely vacant. And so getting in and doing investigations and building in some cases is easier now. Um, we've looked at a lot of buildings that, particularly if you want to look at in-unit te in tenant systems for commercial buildings, it's just easier now because they're empty. 
And so you don't have to discommode any tenants and in order to get residential properties are more com more difficult to get access to. And you know, people don't want anyone coming into their house. Right. Time. Exactly. Although although you still have a lot of vacancies and you may be able to look at typical units if they are vacant. Um, and so it's a weird time, but but the time and the weirdness does present opportunities for people to move quickly and to move in a way that um, makes the investigations easier on uh, on the building and on the tenants. Mm -hmm. How does uh, how does a client reach out to you both to potentially initiate an investigation, and what is the duration of an investigation, and then the uh, the timeline that they need to be working with from there? Well, I mean, uh, you know, look, reach out to uh, to Canny and, uh, and 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 to, to you know start the conversation, and then really the first step is just to, ha to have a conversation with you to talk about the building. Um, um, Adam, I, you like to talk to the operating engineers. Um, yeah, I like to get on site. In terms of, the, I'll talk about the HVAC briefly. Is I mentioned before that lighting is relatively easier to investigate, um, so I'll move beyond that for the moment. Um, in terms of the HVAC equipment, the mechanical equipment, water heating, etc. Uh, we want to get on site. We'll spend um, definitely a day or two in the building looking through all the systems in depth, looking through the systems that you have um, and gaining access to whatever tenant spaces are feasible. As I said, we don't want to discommode any tenants, and, but we can do that in, in, in reasonable ways. Um, the other big thing that we're going to look at, um, oh, and, and John also did mention talking to building operators. That's a very important consideration, um, which we will do, you know, as I mentioned before, you can have efficient controls, but if the controls aren't actually really being used, then the building might not be run well. Um, the other thing that we do have to do, we talked at the very beginning about the financial analysis and a building billing analysis and energy usage analysis. That could be super quick and easy if the billing structure of the building is very straightforward. Some buildings are much more complicated with multiple separately metered or sub-metered spaces. And so that analysis um, really does demand a few conversations potentially in terms of how it will get done and the easiest way to approach it. Um, that analysis could take a while. Um, hopefully it doesn't. Hopefully your building is an easy one. Yeah, I mean, the, the entire investigation, um, it, it'll, it'll vary, of course, as you just said, depending on the type of building, um, the size of the building, the magnitude of it. It's typically four to six weeks because we're doing this on a parallel path. You're gonna be inside talking, you know, doing the HVAC, mechanical systems analysis. Uh, the first step for us is to assess the building and determine how to best and most efficiently uh, inspect it. Uh, do the building info inspection. We, we love to use uh, industrial rope access because it's very quick, it's economical, and we can literally get our hands on all sides and all elevations of the building in a relatively short order. Usually our, our survey of the building envelope is a couple of days. Um, the, the testing itself, you know, we can come on site with, um, you know, with a testing agency and, and in a day or two, uh, get multiple, uh, samples and, and, and readings of air infiltration, for example, probing again. So a comprehensive, the actual investigation portion of it is a couple of weeks, but then we take all that data, analyze it, and then, and then they come up with a strategy to provide, yeah, we need to understand what the scope of work will need to be to get into compliance with 2024, 2030, both mechanical and exterior, and then put together a, a feasibility report with options, laying out, okay, here's what you can do to get uh, into compliance with FISP and Local 97 for 2024. Because the easy scope is, right. the easy stuff is, is to say, I mean, anybody can tell you, replace your facade, put in a continuous air and moisture barrier and insulation and change your windows and there you go. I mean, that's- Well, you may in fact have to do that to get to 2030, but we would break that enormous scope and cost up uh, as best as we possibly can. Um, to phase it out to manageable bites. And the good news is, and, and part three will touch upon this, is that PACE financing allows you, if you can, you know, it, it, would, it, it would cover your, your building envelope repairs as well as mechanical. I mean, it was designed to allow you to deal with the, the building holistically um, inside and out. Right. So we hope, uh, and Stephen, if there's nothing else at this point, um, I'd like to thank everybody. I apologize for, for the uh, interruptions that we had today. Appreciate everybody bearing with us and hanging on. For yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And, uh, and like I said, please join us uh, for, the, for the final part of this when we really focus on how to 
how to how to finance these kinds of upgrades and and, and renovations. Yes, I think it's. Uh, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for what you've had to say this morning. Um, I, you know, I think one of the highlights or important things to take away is that the the output of this investigation is literally documentation that you can use uh, to then facilitate the pace financing that we'll be digging into next week. Um, and uh, while very often uh, listening to lawyers is not always so interesting, uh, PACE itself is a fascinating uh, capability in terms of financing uh, for a building for repairs. As John highlighted, if it's going to lead to improvements in energy performance, then both your FISP work as well as your Local Law 97 work uh, can be structured into that loan. And that loan is not so much a mortgage as it's actually built into the taxes. Uh, and so uh, the ownership impact and the ability to transfer uh, is, uh, is much more flexible. So uh, it is actually a very interesting session. Uh, we've spoken at length uh, uh, with uh, the, the speakers next week, and I think you'll find it very, very interesting. I say next week, um, it's actually positioned for the date is uh, in the second week of August. So look out for the mailer on that. If you have any further questions or if you want to access either the recording from the first seminar or today, uh, please reach out and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Thank you very much.